This is Katrin with Disability Rights New York. Welcome to our podcast, Empire State of Rights Closed Captioned. We are here to bring you information on the most relevant topics regarding disability rights and advocacy. Today, we will be discussing mental illness and substance use disorders with DRNY staff attorney, Allison Lynch. Allison, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So we had an article in the New York Times uh, in February of 2020, and uh, it was really interesting read on a couple of different levels, considering that Senator Harkham had um, come out pretty vocally about some of his own substance abuse uh, history, as well as addressing the stigma that goes along with that, um, not just here in New York State, but really globally. And so there are some things that are changing around this, um, specifically the definition of addiction. In our previous episode, uh, TBI and Substance Use Disorders, we discussed the American Society of Addiction Medicine and how they've revised their definition of addiction and how this legitimizes substance use disorders as treatable brain disorders. So with all of this updated information and a new definition, do you think that it will help remove some of that negative public misconception around substance use addiction? I absolutely do. I think one of the most important things that people like Senator Harkham are helping to achieve is that this is now more and more being recognized as, I'm putting this in quotes, a legitimate condition like other types of organic brain damage or mental or physical illness. It is less and less seen and judged in society as something that's blameworthy or that you could place blame on an individual for you know, succumbing to something like this. I think there's a lot more understanding about what's happening neurologically if someone has an addiction. And you know, we, we know that this is such an extreme percentage of the population who either has addiction or has a mental health issue or has a combination of both. Um, you know, the numbers right now, we have statistics that are showing that roughly 50% of individuals with serious mental illness also have substance abuse issues. And then on the flip side, 37% of individuals with alcohol addiction and 53% of individuals with drug addiction also have at least one serious mental illness. So it encompasses such a, a large group of our population that it's really imperative that we continue to kind of go with this narrative that it should be and is treatable just like any other, again, in quotes, classic mental or physical illness. And those are good points. You know, in that same New York Times article, Senator Riviera, you know, closed with saying that addiction is not a moral failure. And, and I think that was a really important thing for him to say as well publicly. And you just talked about some really large percentages. Those are big numbers. We're not just talking about some anecdotal information here. And really, I think what our audience needs to know is what is the connection between mental illness and substance use disorders? That's a really great question, and it's also a really interesting and kind of rapidly evolving field of research on its own. Um, the questions a lot of the time surround trying to determine kind of which came first is is one of the things that treatment providers and direct service providers try and determine. So, you know, for example, a lot of the time an individual with a mental illness could use alcohol and drugs to self-medicate. And then again, this is made even worse when treatment isn't readily available for one or both of these conditions. And then in the other case, kind of on the flip side, alcohol and drug abuse can actually increase the underlying risk for mental illness. Um, and so to kind of dig into this a little bit over the past 15 years, there's been some really excellent research into the actual neurophysiological similarities between the two. Um, there are a lot of genetic and environmental factors at play in someone's neurophysiological predisposition to certain mental illnesses and also their predisposition to addiction. So for example, our brain's dopamine-based reward system is often discussed in different addiction models. But now some research is actually showing that there's some similar alterations in models of psychiatric disorders. So you're seeing the same pathways in both of these kinds of issues that are duly diagnosed. Um, and the same goes for one of our brain's stress systems. So things like chronic stress and distress, which can result from trauma in people with substance use and people with mental illness can actually activate 
that stress system independently. So there are so many things that we're still learning, and there's so many kind of connections that we're seeing between these two systems. But, you know, we're learning so much more about what's happening at a neurological level. And I think that can only better translate into better, more widespread treatment options and a better understanding of how to kind of get to the root of both of these problems. It's pretty interesting that this field of study really seems to have started only 15 years ago. And in in the grand scheme of things, that's such a short amount of time. So in order to really look at the systemic issues, not just within the medical field, but also, I think, within the law and within our community perception of these issues, we're just kind of starting to get to that point. And when we look at the issues, you know, currently with the systems that we have in place, what are some of the main issues that we're dealing with uh, for people with mental illness and substance abuse disorders? Yeah. So right now, I mean, it's great that we're doing all this research, but really what this has to translate to is, is like you said, actual systemic change. And so there are so many systems that people with these dual diagnoses find themselves in, for example, being incarcerated, being homeless. These can lead to either worsening of one or both mental illness and substance abuse, or it can exacerbate other coexisting disabilities, which can then in turn make things like treatment even harder to find. So the things that we're really dealing with today in kind of the world at large, the world that we live in, is a lack of systemic programming for people who find themselves having to deal with one or statistically usually both of these issues. We don't have the programs in place in jails and prisons to really effectively treat substance use. Um, There's still a lot of problems in those facilities with that. And then people who are homeless, who don't have a place to seek treatment or a place to even kind of feel like they have a stable situation to not only get the treatment, but to work on a lot of the underlying issues that may be causing the worsening of these conditions are are pretty much left to fend for themselves a lot of times without that kind of systemic awareness that these populations are going to be increasingly at risk with the lack of oversight there. So as we see these changes, especially around dual diagnosis and looking at whether it's access to services for, you know, a lot of these communities, what role will DRNY play in this? How will our functioning within this system change or will it? Do you see that happening? I think DRNY can play a really significant role in working with these populations. I mean, the program that I'm a part of, which is the Protection and Advocacy for Individuals with Mental Illness, we're becoming better versed every time we work with a new individual or we work with a new treatment provider to better understand the coexistence of substance use disorders. And I think because we have an eye toward looking at the systemic issues that are affecting New Yorkers with mental illness, the issues that we just talked about, the populations who are incarcerated, who are homeless, who are more likely to really be suffering because of a systemic lack of treatment or uh, lack of services are exactly the people that DRNY would hope to target in terms of being able to look towards what kind of advocacy or even potential litigation might be available to really assist these more vulnerable populations as we continue to learn more. And as we discussed earlier, there's there are some new laws and there are some new bills that are being put forward specifically by the Senate. Can you talk to us about those and how they will be influencing the direction of these new findings? Yeah, so there are a couple of new bills, both state and federal, that aim to address the opioid crisis. And with that comes increased funding, increased kind of different program options and alternatives, depending on how those funds are allocated. And, you know, I do want to kind of make it clear that by just addressing the opioid crisis, we're not addressing substance use and substance abuse at large. There are still wide swaths of that population that doesn't necessarily fall under opioid addiction, but still has problems with substance use and abuse. So those individuals may not be able to find the same kind of treatment and programming, even though it looks like there's a bigger effort being made to address substance use disorders. So I think something that 
we have to keep in the back of our minds is that while it's really important that these efforts are being recognized and that a lot more money is being directed towards individuals who are addicted to opioids, it's not the be all end all. It's not something that we can then walk away from and say, okay, we did as much as we can. There's still a lot of other people who are still very vulnerable who may not be getting the benefits from these types of bills being passed. In a wider sense, you know, locally and in a lot of the states now, we do have things like diversion programs and mental health courts. And those types of programs can a lot of the time take in individuals who may not be able to as readily seek services in the community if they don't have a kind of particular type of substance use disorder where that's being addressed in these kind of federal and state bills. So individuals who have a mental illness, who have a substance use disorder, who are diverted from the kind of traditional route of incarceration may end up still doing equally well in some of these diversion programs because they allow for a more targeted approach while allowing the individual to remain living in the community, but setting them up with services that more directly address their needs. So I think a combination of both increasing these types of bills that are aimed at providing more funding to treatment providers in general, as well as this kind of local on the ground diversion effort in the criminal justice system are things that are really kind of helping to shore up the system here in New York State. It sounds like there's a lot of effort being put forward to move in the right direction around this, as you discuss some diversion programs, as well as some of the bills that maybe aren't fully encompassing the entire issue right now. But would it be fair to say that you think that we're moving in the direction that can help resolve some of these systemic issues if if we continue on this path? Absolutely. I think just by virtue of the fact that it's being discussed, we're farther ahead than we were probably five or 10 years ago. There's there's so much more public awareness. And even though that hasn't and won't translate to a complete resolution of all of these issues, it remains in the dialogue. And it, like we talked about earlier, continues to mitigate that stigma and that judgment that people so often feel. And that is a win in and of itself, even though we're obviously going to want to continue to push for better access to services, better funding, better treatment options, things like that. So we're just going to keep in the fight on this. It sounds like there's a lot of forward motion on these issues, and I appreciate all the information you gave us. This is such a great topic, and I appreciate you coming on and talking with us today. Thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. We'll talk to you again soon. Empire State of Rights closed captioned has been brought to you by Disability Rights New York, your source for disability rights and advocacy. If you enjoyed our program, make sure to subscribe, like, and share this post. If there is a subject you would like us to discuss, please email podcast at drny.org or comment below. Tune in next Wednesday, where we'll bring you more information on disability rights in the state of New York. The closed captioned version of this podcast is available on our YouTube channel. To listen to more Empire State of Rights closed captioned, follow us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify.